Today we are going to discuss a topic that plays a big part in the quality of an iOS project and that topic is tooling. Nowadays we are very lucky because there are actually quite a lot of tools that can really help us improve the quality of our iOS projects and most of them are actually free and open source. So in this video I want to show you five of those tools that I think are particularly awesome. So the first of these tools is called Swiftlint and as you can guess from its name it's indeed a linter. And this means that this tool is going to parse our source code and is going to check that our source code is compliant with a set of rules. And the goal of these rules is going to be to enforce some common coding best practices, coding style, coding guidelines across our project. So as you can see here, we are on the GitHub page of Swiftlint and on the readme of the project, well, we can see an example of what Swiftlint is going to look like, what it will provide once it is integrated into an iOS project. So we can see that whenever we write code that does not follow the rules set in Swiftlint, for instance, if we do a force cast or if we don't align our code as expected, well, we are going to get either some errors or some warnings depending on the rules that have been violated. And what's super nice is that the developers will be notified of these errors as soon as they build their project. This way, it will be very easy for them to rectify the mistake. So now let's take a look at how we install Swiftlint. So Swiftlint is a command line tool, so you can install it actually using several tools. So you can use Homebrew, you can use CocoaPod, you can just also download the binary. It really depends on your preferences. But once you have downloaded this command line tool, you need to integrate it into your Xcode project. And the way to do it, so it is explained also in the readme, is that you need to add a new run script phase in the build phases of your project, and then you need to add this script inside this new build phase. So as you can see, the script is very simple. It's just going to check that Swiftlint is indeed installed on the system, and then it's going to run the executable. And if Swiftlint is not installed for some reason, it's going to echo a warning to make you aware that you need to install Swiftlint. So just below, you have an example actually of how it looks like once it is integrated into Xcode. And that's actually it. Once you've done this, that's it, Swiftlint is integrated. And from that point, whenever you build your project, Swiftlint is going to be run automatically. And this way, if the code you've added doesn't follow the rules set in Swiftlint, you will be notified immediately. So I said that the goal of Swiftlint is to enforce some rules. So here there is a section that speaks in more detail about these rules. So what you need to know is that there are a lot of rules, actually more than 100 already included in Swiftlint. And these rules, well, basically they cover all the standard guidelines we can expect from a Swiftlinter. So of course you are still free to configure Swiftlint as you see fit. So for instance, you can see in this example that it's actually possible to disable a rule if it makes sense for a specific part of your code. But you can also see in the same readme that you can configure Swiftlint using a swiftlint.yml file and in this file you can explicitly disable rules that maybe don't make sense for your project or you can configure some specific rules. For instance, there is a rule about the maximum length of a line of code. Well, as you can see here, it's possible to set a custom value if there is one that makes more sense in the context of your project. So you are really still the master of how Swiftlint is going to work with your project and you have the power to disable everything that could be just well, that could just not make sense in your context. And if you need some custom rules that are not defined in Swiftlint, well, as you can see, there is also a syntax that can allow you to define your own rules using some kind of regex syntax. And finally, I wanted to highlight this super useful feature of Swiftlint, which is that if you include Swiftlint in a project that already has a lot of files, there is some chance that you're going to have a lot of warnings and a lot of errors. And that makes sense because Swiftlint enforces a lot of rules. And if you have not enforced them before, well, probably some mistakes a slip by. Well, in Swiftlint, there is a feature called autocorrect. And what this feature does is that it's going to try and automatically fix all the mistakes that can be automatically fixed by Swiftlint. So it's not going to fix everything, but most of the time it can get a lot of things right. All right, that's all for the first tool. Now we move on to the second one. So the second one is called NetFox, and it's a tool to help developers debug their network request. So as you can see on the GIF here, NetFox, it's a little tool that you're going to add in your app and it's going to intercept all your network requests and it's going to basically give you a debug view where you can see the status of all the network requests that have been made by your app. And as you can imagine, well, it's going to be super useful when you want to debug such kind of code. So once again, this tool is super easy to integrate. You need to first add it to your project. So it's compatible with CocoaPod and Carthage. So to integrate NetFox in your project, you just need to actually call this method in your app delegate. So of course you want to wrap this call in if debug statement in order to only integrate NetFox for debug builds. And then once this is done, that's it. NetFox is now part of your debug build. And in order to see the debug view, well, you just need to shake the device and it will appear. Of course, if you don't want to shake your device, you can implement a custom gesture. And now let's move on to the third tool. 
So the third tool is called SwiftGen. It's a code generation tool and it's going to generate Swift code to help us encapsulate all the access to the resources of our project. So if you have some experience with iOS, you know that all the resources that we have in our project, so things like images, localized strings, fonts, etc., the way that we interact with them is through strings, meaning that we are going to call, for instance, the init of your image and pass in the name of the image as a string. Now, the downside of this kind of API is that it's called a stringly typed API, meaning that it's very easy to make a mistake. You just make a typo in a string and your app is not going to work the way you intended to work. So of course, we can improve on this situation by writing by hand some Swift code is going to bring some type safety, but it takes time and it's kind of a burden to have to write it by hand. And the goal of SwiftGen is to actually generate all this kind of code, all this boilerplate code that will allow us to interact with our resources in a more type safe manner. So once again, to integrate this tool in your project, you need to install it, for instance, using CocoaPod, but you can see that there are other ways to install it. Then you're going to have to configure it. So you need to give it a configuration file. As you can see, this file, while well, it's going to be a map of where the resources of your project are located. So in most projects, it's going to be the strings and the XC asset catalog. So here you have an example of how SwiftGen is going to parse and generate code for an asset catalog. So you can see that in the configuration file, there is the location for the asset catalog, and there is as the output, the name of the Swift file that will be generated. And here we can see what is generated. So we can see that an enum is being generated and in the enum, while well, we can access the content of the XC asset. So it can be some data asset, some image asset, but also colors or other kind of resources. Here, I think it's a resource for augmented reality. And as you can see in the example just below, once you have this code generated, you no longer need to rely on stringly typed API. You can now use the code generated by SwiftGen. So so for instance, if you want to access an image, you can see that you can use this code, which has the advantage of being type safe, meaning that if there is a typo somewhere in this, well, your code is going to no longer build. And this way, the error will be caught at compile time and not once your app is on the store and it's too late to see it. Next tool is also a code generation tool, but this one is much more generalist. So Sorcery is a tool that allows you to generate basically any kind of Swift code. So I'm not going to go in detail about it, mostly because I've already done a double episode on this topic, but I just want to highlight the example that is given on the readme because I think it's the one that can make sense for a lot of projects. So in a lot of projects, you're going to want to abstract your features behind protocols. And then something that can be convenient once you have this protocol is to have a mocked version of the protocol. It can be useful either to run a mock version of the app or to perform some unit tests, for instance. So here you can see an example of such a mock. And even though it can be written by hand, we can see that there is actually a lot of boilerplate involved. So we don't want to write it by hand. Well, Sorcery, it comes built in with a template called AutoMockable. And once you have a protocol, you just need to write an extension like this, where you say that your protocol conforms to AutoMockable. This protocol, AutoMockable, is actually empty, but it's going to work like a marker, so a tag, so that when Sorcery is run, it's going to take all the protocols that conform to AutoMockable and it will generate mocks for all of them. So this is one of the use cases of Sorcery. It can really save you a lot of time if you need to implement mocks in your app. Once again, that's just the tip of the iceberg. We can do a lot of things with Sorcery, but I wanted to highlight this particular use case since it's the one that they show on their winry. And finally, the last tool I wanted to show you is called Fastlane. So Fastlane, it's an automation tool that's going to help you with all the things that are about deploying your app. So you can see that on their website, they highlight four use cases. So the first use case is that Fastlane can help you automate making screenshots of your app. So if your app is sold on the App Store in several languages, well, you need to provide screenshots for each language and making these screenshots by hand, it can take a lot of time. And Fastlane can really help you here because you can write a script in Fastlane that will then automatically generate the screenshots for all the local that your app supports. Then you can also use Fastlane to distribute beta builds, meaning that in Fastlane, there are already some functions that are going to help you upload some builds either to tools like Firebase, App Center, Test Flight, etc. And of course, you also have the same feature when you want to deploy your app to the real store, so to the real app store. And finally, Fastlane can also help you a lot managing the code signing of your iOS project, meaning that Fastlane is going to be able to integrate both with your project and also with your Apple developer account. And this way, it will act kind of like an interface in order to fetch the correct signing assets. And this can be super useful. For instance, if you use a CI platform, this way you won't have to manually fetch and install your signing assets on your CI platform.
And here you can see an example of the file that you use when you want to configure Fastlane. So it's a file called the fast file. And as you can see, it's just a configuration file written in Ruby. All right, so that's all for this video where I wanted to introduce you to five tools that can really help you improve your iOS project. Now, all the links to this project are in the description. So I can only encourage you to go check them out and see which one would make sense in the context of your own project. Thank you for watching this video and see you next time.